Welcome back to Our World. Tonight is a rather special edition, a story told through the eyes of a camera, which explains why we're in an imitation screening room instead of at an imitation newsstand. The newsstand would tell us this. By the 15th of December, 1939, Europe was at war with itself again. The screening room tells us this. By the 15th of December, 1939, America will be at war with itself again. Only this time, the Civil War will be fought on a silver screen. That is, if the uncivil war to make a movie out of Gone with the Wind ends before opening night. Right now, that war remains bogged down in the Battle of the Scarlet's O'Hara. Here was David Selznick's problem in 1938. His quest for some Betty Jones from Bartlesville to play Scarlett O'Hara had failed, as he probably knew it would. But he didn't want a superstar either, somebody who might put too much of herself in the part. So Selznick spent a lot of time hunkered down in his screening room, watching test after test after test of ordinary movie stars who wanted to play the most vexing vixen in the history of the movies. Scarlet. Scarlet. What's the matter, Miss Scarlet? Well, hey, hey, Scarlet O'Hara. The South wanted to Lula Bankhead or a Southern girl. The North wanted Catherine Hepburn. The West wanted Joan Fontaine. All around Hollywood, and every studio wanted their star to be Scarlet. So that's why all the testing took place. Oh, Ashley. You're wrong. I do want to escape, too. I, I'm so tired of it all. I've, I've struggled for food and for money. I've weeded and hoed and picked cotton and even plowed until I can't stand it any longer. Oh, Ashley, you're wrong. I do want to escape, too. I'm so very tired of it all. I've struggled for food and for money. I've weeded and hoed and picked cotton. I've even plowed. Ashley, I do want to escape, though. Oh, Ashley, I'm so tired of everything. I struggle for food and money. I've weeded and hoed, picked cotton, and plowed until I just can't stand it another minute. Jean Arthur was an old, old friend of Selznick's. She would have been all right. All of them would have been all right, but he was looking for the perfect one. And the closest we could get to a perfect scarlet, that is, you know, a woman who could claw her way to the top and, and who was really the first woman's liber who, who fought the world and won. The closest to that personality in the testing was Paulette Goddard. Why, Charles Hamilton, you handsome old thing, you. Did you think it was kind of you to bring this good-looking brother of yours down here to break our poor, simple country house? I won't eat barbecue with you, Charles Hamilton, so don't you go off flandering with any other girl, because I'm mighty jealous. Quiet, speak. All right. And you want to show the back of the thing? Yes. You want to turn around, now turn around. Well, goodbye now. But Paulette Goddard wasn't proper enough to play the improper Scarlet. Miss Goddard was living with Charlie Chaplin. Selznick told her she could have the part if she could produce a marriage license. But if Gable played his part to get a divorce, Miss Goddard would not get married to play her part. The tests for Scarlet, of course, were fascinating to look at today. Everybody had a different concept. And probably nobody had a closer view than Douglas Montgomery, the actor who got paid to kiss the contestants, but not to judge them. In this test, the man is being screened. It's Melvin Douglas testing for the part of Ashley, or maybe for the part of Douglas Montgomery. It said Selznick liked what he saw, but not enough. Say that you love me. Say it. Say that you love me. Don't. Don't. Still no Scarlet, and it was time to start shooting the movie. Selznick had to clear out his back lot anyway, so he began with the most spectacular scene in the film, The Burning of Atlanta. The man who talked him into it was art director Lyle Wheeler. I knew that we had to uh, 
wreck a certain number of buildings to get them out of the way. So I came up with the idea that the best thing to do would be to have the fire on the lot. I got permission to burn down everything I could light a match to. You could only burn it once, no retakes here. The close-up scenes of Scarlet and Rhett fleeing the burning Atlanta would be superimposed later. The fire burning, raging mad. We had all the fire departments of Culver City and Los Angeles and Pasadena, everybody was there. They thought the world was on fire. It was such a huge conflagration. You know, all the sets and all the boxes, everything we could find went into that fire. The flames carried 300 feet into the night sky. 200 invited guests watched the scene, among them an actress whom Selznick had considered for Scarlet, but whom he was to meet for the first time that night, Vivian Lee. The scene was at its height when Myron Selznick walked in, holding by the hand a very, very beautiful girl, and she came in with Myron, who brought her up to Mr. Selznick, he was standing and watching this whole scene and said, David, I want you to meet your Scarlett O'Hara. And I tell you, she was the embodiment of Scarlett O'Hara. No one who saw her could think anything else. Mr. Selznick just flipped. He said to me, she is everything I dreamed of. Now, if she can only act. Ashley, let's run away. I'm tired looking after the folks. Someone can take care of them. We go to Mexico. They want office in the Mexican army. We'd be so happy there. I'd work for you. I'd do anything for you. You know you don't love Melanie. And Melanie can't. Well, Dr. Fontaine said she could never have any more children, and I'd forgive you. We forget that, dear, Do you think I could ever forget it? Have you forgotten it? Can you honestly say you don't love me? No, I don't love you. It's a lie. And of course, she was a brilliant actress. They tested her, silent tests, wardrobe tests. She was just the ideal. She was the most glowing vibrant, dynamic woman I had ever met. Don't. Don't. You love me. No, don't. You love me. No, don't. 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 You love me. You we won't won't do me. this. I tell you, we won't do it. It won't happen again. I'll take Melanie and the baby. And go. Say it. You love me. No, all right, I'll say it. I love your courage and your stubbornness. I love him so much that a moment ago I could have forgotten the best wife a man ever had. But Scarlett, I'm not going to forget her. I loved her. I loved her beauty, I loved her talent, and I loved the fact that she represented something that women were not at that time. Namely, strong, persuasive, determined. We were going to get to the top, and she clawed her way right up the top in that book. As God is my witness, they're not going to leave me. I'm going to live through this, and when it's all over, I'll never be hungry again. She was a, an exquisite creature. She had very beautiful manners and um, a very feminine way. She was also, I think, capricious and a bit perverse, which made her interesting, of course. She was a rather complex person and very like Scarlett. We just fell in at the last moment to the perfect Scarlett O'Hara. Well, the cast is finally in place. Filming is about to begin. Come back to the set for Gone with the Wind, where only Job could be comfortable. Our world will be right back. Gone with the Wind, making of a classic, 1939. We owe it to you, so we invite GM and Ford to follow Chrysler. You know, for five years, I've been feeling like the guy who sent invitations to a party, and nobody came. 
Well, somebody finally showed up. GM and Ford decided the time has come to improve their warranties. Chrysler says, welcome to the party. It's good for America. Maybe that's why we haven't heard from the Japanese. Millions of Americans are only getting two or three year protection. What are they, second class citizens? We've backed five million Chrysler owners with 550 protection. Our quality had to improve and dramatically. So the party's over. Chrysler announces the end of 550 and the beginning of 770, the best powertrain protection in the business. Seven years or 70,000 miles on the powertrain, 100,000 miles against outer body rust through on every Chrysler, Dodge, and Plymouth we build, car, truck, and minivan. Like I said, if you're looking for who builds them best, take a good look at who backs them best. Headache, pressure, and congestion all together. Major symptoms of sinus complex. You need to feel better, but not drowsy. You need Sinutab 2, no drowsiness formula, so you feel altogether better. When a stomach balks, Davy Johnson reaches for serious medicine. Rolaids consumes all the acid required to bring millions 100% relief, and relief is needed on days like these. I should have gone into golf. Get serious relief. Get Rolaids. Saturday on ABC's Professional Bowlers Tour. Roll on down to the $140,000 Bowlers Journal Florida BPA Open. Then on ABC's Wide World of Sports, former world and Olympic champions compete. For the men, Scott Hamilton, Robin Cousins and more. For the ladies, Dorothy Hamill, Rosalind Sumners and others. $40,000 to the winners at the World Challenge of Champions. Saturday shines on ABC Sports. Welcome back to a special edition of Our World. Sir Lawrence Olivier once noted that acting is not quite the occupation of an adult. Sir Lawrence Olivier was once married to Vivian Lee, the actress chosen to play Scarlett O'Hara. As you will see, where Gone with the Wind is concerned, acting was one of only several occupations not quite suited for adults. Begin with the directors. The producer did. All right. Gone with the Wind, Drake. Quiet, speak. Speak, speak. Just a second, sink. Quiet, speak. A lot of Camera. Vivian Lee, she loved George Cukor, and therefore she hated Victor Fleming, who replaced him. Fleming is a man's director, and he, he likes things gutsy, and he wanted, like, for Vivian Lee, might be, tend to be a little bit on the feminine side, and he wanted her to be bitchy. He would goad her into being bitchy. And he always teased her by calling her Fiddle Dee Dee. For some reason or other, that annoyed her. My guess is that purposely he did that to keep her bitchy. Even Mr. Fleming, strong and macho as he was, had a nervous breakdown at one point. It was a picture full of nervous breakdowns, or potential breakdowns, including mine. After one day, Selznick had shot one and a half scenes and spent more than a million dollars, a third of his total budget. But he refused to compromise his obsession with authenticity. Production manager Ray Clune tried to bring order out of the chaos. The biggest production challenge on Gone with the Wind uh, was probably David Selznick because David used to call me between two and three in the morning often uh, to find out whether or not I could change the aspect of the scene. In his desire for what he hoped would be almost perfection, he made life very miserable for everybody else. The hours, the working hours, the perfection. There were 5,500 costume sketches made for that film. The hardest thing was to keep up with, uh, keep up with David Selznick and his, uh, his change that he did day and night. Sometimes I had to rebuild entire sets up and down the street. It was up to me to uh, keep ahead of them. He was considered a nuisance because nothing ever pleased him. Victor Fleming got so angry many, many, many times that he'd walk off the set because Mr. Selznick's directing the picture. In between rewrites and nitpicking, Selznick devised one incredible sequence that, given the equipment available at the time, was impossible to shoot. Oh, that railroad sequence is uh, still one of the most uh, sensational things that's ever been put on film. The uh, challenge there was finding a, a, a crane that was large enough uh, to deliver the kind of shot that he wanted. The scene started 
on a very small focus of a few men dying, writhing on the ground. You didn't know where they were, what was going on. You knew the scarlet was going to come looking for the doctor. And then as the, as the camera pulled back, the whole dimension widened and widened. And in order to get it to cover the whole railroad station, they had to have a crane which was higher than anything that had ever been built. It was such a masterpiece of a shot. That particular sequence, there were only 500 and some odd uh, extras available. So we had anticipated that and uh, had about a thousand dummies. Subsequently, the Screen Extras Guild sued us and wanted us to pay uh, for extras for all of the dummies. Then there was the business about Technicolor. The cameras were huge. They used three separate negatives, red, green, and blue. Many producers thought color was a costly gimmick. Some had said the same thing about talking pictures. Wrong again. We had, uh, had changed to color. Color was brand new at the time for all of us. All our cameramen, camera people, it was new to them. It was a very expensive work because we would make test after test after test, and we tested every single thing, every costume, the looks on people. We spent weeks and weeks, so to be sure it was right. I love the old Technicolor cameras. I always felt like I was acting for them because they're huge, and, and they envelop you. I mean, they, you, they're part of what you're doing. They, you're in the camera, you know. You are the film as you do it. Gable didn't like his costumes and didn't like a script that changed faster than he could memorize it, but not faster than his co-star could memorize it. Vivian Lee and Clark Gable were uh, very incompatible. Gable was always fighting for his life against his spirited girl. He felt that it was a, a woman's picture. It was Scarlett O'Hara's picture. And he says, I'm a big star. I don't want to play second fiddle to some dame. Scarlett, kiss me. Kiss me once. I don't know if I should say this, but you know, Clark Gable had false teeth. And she didn't like to kiss him. <laughs> It's wonderfully constructed. Something happens every three minutes. Then the theme itself, which I suppose is survival, is eternal and it's universal. Mr. David O. Selznick. Three years of effort have led to this moment. If Atlanta, which is the final judge, approved our efforts, these labors will not have been in vain. Sometimes you have a vehicle that is so great that nothing is going to destroy it. Even though the story editor at Selznick International told Mr. Selznick that this was nothing but a sentimental piece of tripe. And one of the other men in the studio, one of David's very close friends, said it's it's only a story of a bitch and a bastard. Nobody's going to be interested in people like that. It was great simply because there was a bitch and there was a bastard. And they were fascinating people and they were strong and determined. And you cared about what was going to happen to them. Red! You go. What shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. This is a cutting room, and this, this is a strip of celluloid. What a funny way to preserve the image of an era. What a funny thing to become the language of an era. Come back to the legacy of a strip of celluloid, or something like that. When it comes to designing a luxury touring sedan, you continually stress precision. You overemphasize ergonomics and select only the finest leathers. The last thing you do is cut corners. 
You save that for the handling. The Acura Legend from a new division of American Honda, exclusively at Acura Dealers. If you're looking for a simple way to apply for the American Express card, simply pick up one of these, because now you can apply over the phone. Just call 1-800-THE-CARD. Sauerkraut, Limburger cheese, dishwasher odor. It's Arm & Hammer baking soda to the rescue. Just sprinkle about a quarter cup in your dishwasher to absorb odors between loads. Arm & Hammer baking soda freshens the fridge, freezer, and the dishwasher too. Next. America! This is the man and this is the time. Now what if we execute you? I want him killed. America continues. Welcome back to our world. The movie of Gone with the Wind was conceived in doubt and delivered with pain. But from the moment of its birth, it was a strapping, princely child. It grossed $20 million in the first five months of its release. It spawned artifacts of every conceivable kind all over the world. It was dubbed or translated into 25 languages. So, hooray for Hollywood. Maestro, one more time. Everybody is here tonight. Everybody in movie land. Yes, everybody's here. Tall, bashful James Stewart. It's Mr. Charles Lawton with his distinguished wife, Elsa Lanchester. Everybody, you bet everybody. Scarlett O'Hara, her glorious self. Vivian Lee, escorted by producer David Selznick. Olivia de Havilland, escorted by John Hay Whitney. But here's Elsa Max. We'll start the party, folks. Now everything's ready to go. And now let's get right to it. The awards of 1939. First, the technical awards. To William Cameron Menzies for his outstanding use of color in Gone with the Wind. To Hal Kern and James Newcomb for film editing, Gone with the Wind. To Ernest Haller, color cinematography. And the same to Ray Renahan, Gone with the Wind. To Lyle Wheeler for art direction, Gone with the Wind. Next introduction is the return engagement by request of the Rhett Butler of the Air, Bob Hope. Thank you, President. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Really, I think this is a wonderful thing, a benefit like this for David Selznick, and I want to tell you... Gone with the wind kept on bringing in the sheaves. Gone with the wind, the screenplay by Sidney Howard. The best direction of 1939 to Victor Fleming, the man who directed Gone with the Wind. The Irving G. Thalberg Memorial to producer David O. Selznick. The Academy Award for the best performance of an actress in supporting role, the Hattie McDaniel. For the finest interpretation of 1939 by an actress, Vivian Lee in Gone with the Wind. Ladies and gentlemen, Please forgive me if my words are inadequate in thanking you for your very great kindness. If I were to mention all those who've shown me such wonderful generosity through Gone with the Wind, I should have to entertain you with an oration as long as Gone with the Wind itself. So, if I may, I should like to devote my thanks on this occasion to that composite figure of energy, courage, and very great kindness in whom all points have gone where the wind meet, Mr. David Selznick. The year's greatest picture, Gone with the Wind. Epic making, truly sensational, winner tonight of 10 major awards, 10 little Oscars all in a row, all paying well-earned tribute to the genius of its producer, David O. Selznick. And in Mr. Selznick's own words tonight, to the authoress, Margaret Mitchell, who made it all possible. Nobody thought it would be the success it was when and, and Mr. Selznick felt that if he got his money out of it, he would be fortunate. David Selznick got his money out of it, but little profit. He had bartered most of that away to finance the production. He died of a heart attack in 1965. Clark Gable did not win an Oscar for playing Rhett Butler, but he did get to marry Carol Lombard. Lombard died in a plane crash in 1942, Gable of a heart ailment in 1960. Vivian Lee married her lover Lawrence Olivier in 1940, they were later divorced. She died of consumption in 1967 at 53. Leslie Howard, anxious to go home, 
stayed in America just until the picture was finished. And he soon afterwards left for England and, of course, met his death as a British intelligence officer during the war. He had only two or three years of life left to him when we were filming. Olivia de Havilland later won two Oscars for Best Actress. She now lives in Paris. Hattie McDaniel, the first black to win an Oscar, worked steadily after that, later starred in a radio series about a maid. Butterfly McQueen is still performing, most recently in the Mosquito Coast with Harrison Ford. She lives in Harlem and is a volunteer at a local public school. Sidney Howard never lived to see the movie he got credit and an Oscar for writing. He was killed in a tractor accident before the film was finished. Victor Fleming directed only five pictures after Gone with the Wind. Soon after his last one, Joan of Arc, he died of a heart attack in 1949. Margaret Mitchell said she saw the movie five times. In 1949, in Atlanta, she was hit by a car on Peachtree Street and died. It's become a cult film. One man told me he had seen it 121 times. Well, there it is the way it was for the making of a classic. David Selznick's son is producing a documentary called The Making of Gone with the Wind for showing on television during 50th anniversary celebrations in 1989. Gone with the Wind is a monument to the romance and folly and dry rot of the old South. It's as real as Mark Twain's Missouri or the faces on Mount Rushmore. But a confession now. I was never able to finish the book or sit through the whole movie. I think because for me, no matter how exquisitely Scarlet and Rhett and Ashley and Melanie were painted, underneath they were all Dorian Gray. Margaret Mitchell, from all accounts, never got over the silly notion there was something vulgar about fame. She ran from the idea of a sequel. But she's been dead 38 years and the same cannot be said of her estate. There's to be a sequel, I hear. Start casting, start writing. At least this time, you won't have to worry about that dam Rhett Butler frankly did not give last time. You see, in 1939, the Hollywood Production Code forbade the use of oaths like dam. Selznick, however, argued that the Oxford English Dictionary, on a bridge version, described dam not as an oath, but as a vulgarism. Well, censors, like estates, know a thing or two when it comes to vulgar, and the censors proved it by letting Selznick leave the word in the movie, then fining him $5,000 for leaving the word in the movie. And so it goes. These things also happened on the way to opening night. In June of 1938, Selznick announced that Norma Shearer would play Scarlett O'Hara. It was a trial balloon quickly shot down by movie fans. In a 1938 poll of movie fans, Betty Davis won, hands down. Among the actresses tested for Scarlet were Lucille Ball and Edith Mariner. Mariner changed her name to Susan Hayward. When Vivian Lee took her screen test, she said the costume was still warm from the previous actress. To shoot the burning of Atlanta, Selznick used seven Technicolor cameras. That's all there were in Hollywood. The fire lasted for an hour and a half. Fred Crane, who played Brent Tarleton, was paid $1,238. For a transcript of this broadcast, send $3 to Our World Transcripts, 2 John Street, New York, New York, 10038. For the Our World Viewer Guide, write to Community Relations. ABC, 1330 Avenue of the Americas, New York, New York, 1019. Millions of Americans can't read. Join the fight against illiteracy. These people all have something in common. They've all been chosen as ABC News Person of the Week. People worth talking about. Friday, ABC News will choose again, and who it is may surprise you. Watch ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings.